James 3, beginning in verse 13. We're going to go today through chapter 4, verse 12, Lord willing. We're going to talk about genuine faith demonstrates wisdom and humility. So James 3, 13, who is wise and understanding among you? Let it show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Then in chapter 4, Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and do not have, you murder and covet and cannot obtain, you fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And I think that might be where I stopped. So I'll just, uh, we'll just look at those verses right there this morning. Let's pray together and ask the Lord's blessing upon the studying of his word. Father God, we just bow before you at this moment because we acknowledge that uh, we need you to give us understanding to your word that your spirit would speak to our hearts, that you would open our minds and our eyes and our hearts and our wills to your word today, that we might live and do and think in ways that are pleasing to you. And God will give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. So, uh, who is wise and understanding among you? Back to verse 13, James 3. Who is wise and understanding among you? It says, let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. It seems to me James here is saying that the wise and understanding person will show it. They will reveal that they are such by their good conduct, by their good works. And that's one of the themes of James's letter is that Christians should be about good works. Good works don't save us, but they certainly are the fruit of our salvation. So uh, he says here that uh, let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. In other words, these are real these are genuine. They're not fake. This is not somebody putting on a veneer or a, or a false, uh, you know, fakiness. They're, they're doing it because it's coming out of their relationship with Christ, their walk with the Lord. And their good conduct is that consistent Christ-like life that selfless life that thinks of others and does uh, unto others. And then, of course, that also, I would include good speech as well, the words that we say. Because remember, last week, we talked about some speech, how our words also are a part of our good works. We need to have good words that match our good works as well. So when you have uh, words 
good, good words and, and good works happening in someone who's living a consistent Christ-like life, um, that's going to reveal that this person, that you, if this is you, have wisdom and understanding when it comes to God and the things of God and his word. But then he says, if you have bitter envy, this is verse 14, and self-seeking, some of yours might say selfish ambition, in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. Do not boast and lie against the truth. Because if your life is characterized by boasting, or excuse me, bitter envy and self-seeking, um, you lie and contradict what you believe to be true. And let me let me try to explain that a little bit. Um, envy. He talks about envy in verse 14. Envy was one of the first sins that ever occurred. It happened in the Garden of Eden. Um, the serpent came to Eve and said, you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And Eve began to look at the fruit in a different way. She began to see that it was desirable, uh, ple pleasant to the eyes and, and desirable to eat and touch and all of those things. So she began to want that. She began to want the fruit not only because it looked good, but because of what the serpent said it would do. Your eyes would be open. You would understand things you never knew before. You would be like God. In other words, he tempted her to want to want something that someone has that you don't have and you want. You envy that person. So Eve began to envy God. She wanted to be like God. She wanted to have what he had. Well, when you think back in our study of James, you go back to chapter 2 about the rich man who shows up at church in his fine clothes and everything. Everyone envied that person. And they showed partiality and favoritism toward that person who had what they wanted, what they wished that they had. They wanted to treat him better than other people so that they could somehow climb the social ladder. In other words, they were guilty not only of envy, but Envy often has a twin called self-seeking and selfish ambition. And that's what they wanted. That's what Eve wanted in the garden. That's what the, some people in the church wanted. James wrote about in chapter 2, seeking to climb the, the social ladder. There are some people who believe that the Christian faith and the church are to be exploited for their own interest. And that's wrong. That is not what the church is for. The church is where God's people meet together to serve one another, to love one another, to worship God, and to witness, to, to, to work together to reach the community. Some people think that the purpose of the church is to help the poor. Well, that is one thing we do, but that's not purpose. Some people think it's to pay rent for people who need help paying rent. Well, sometimes we are able to do that, but that's not the primary purpose of the church. Some people think that the purpose of the church is to feed and clothe people. Well, that's not the primary purpose of the church in the scriptures. The primary purpose of the church is to be salt and light to tell others about Christ, to live together on mission for God. And so our primary purpose is the gospel, first of all, and how that works out in our lives together. But some of the secondary and third level and fourth level things that we can do are those things. Um, 
the scripture talks about how we're to take care of our members first and then take care of other people outside the church. But uh, James here says, if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, don't boast and lie against the truth. In other words, you're living hypocritically against what you claim to be as a Christian. And then he goes on to explain where the desire to even live that way comes from. In verse 15, he says, this wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, and demonic. So it comes from hell. That's where the desire to live contrary to God's ways and God's word comes from. In other words, the, the Apostle John, in his letter of 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, refers to this in a similar way. He calls it the world, the flesh, and the devil. So, and then in the Old Testament, the book of Proverbs, the Bible says that there is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof is death. So maybe you think it's right, maybe you think it's good, maybe you think it's appropriate, but this wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, and demonic. It's not from above. When you behave like that, it's not of God. There's nothing godly about it. And not only that, but it causes problems. Look at verse 16. For where, there is, where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. When you have people in the church living like this, it hurts the church. It tears up a church. It affects the witness of the church. It brings confusion and evil into the church. It's ungodly and it's unchristian and believers should not behave that way. And if you are behaving that way, then you need to repent and confess and turn, forsake it and, and turn back to the Lord. In fact, he talks about the wisdom that is good, the wisdom that is from above, verse 17. That's what we want. The wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy. That sounds pretty good. Is that what you want? Is that how you would like your life as a Christian to be uh, characterized? That's how it should be. In fact, back in chapter 1 of James, verse 5, uh, we are implored that if, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. So this wisdom is available to every believer. It is a gift from God. So don't think that you can live the Christian life without asking God and seeking him for this wisdom that you need, this gift from God. It is, it is from God. God, but look at that verse there where it talks about the this wisdom, how it's pure, peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy. That sort of sounds like that list that Paul gives, doesn't it, of the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5. There are some similarities here, and we would expect that among believers, James and Paul, are in sync with one another. They are not contradicting each other. In other words, this wisdom is first of all pure, it's holy, it's clean, it's godly. So that's where it's the source of it comes from God, so it would reflect who he is. It's peaceable. I love peace. <laughs> I, 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 the world needs more peace, I'll tell you. Our country needs more peace. But the church, sometimes churches can, can go through tough times and there's, they need peace. So if, if you want peace in your life and in the life of your church, seek the wisdom that's from above 
because it's peaceable. It's not confusing like the wisdom from below is. It, it is not boisterous. It's not self-seeking. It's not those things. The wisdom that's from above is pure and it's peaceable. It's also gentle. Don't you like it when people treat you gently and not roughly and harshly? and mean. People can be mean, can't they? There's no reason for us to be that way. Um, our standard is, is Jesus. He's our example. He's the way we're supposed to treat other people. I, I think here, James, when he talks about gentle, means being not argumentative, not being angry. He already told us that about the anger of man doesn't bring about the righteousness of God. Um, not being contentious or wrathful. That's not, that doesn't behoove, behoove the, the Christian life. Willing to yield. In other words, you listen to the other person. You are willing to obey the other person if you need to, if they're right. You're swift to hear and slow to speak. I think that kind of goes along with this willing to yield. And then full of mercy. Um, we're to be merciful because God's been merciful to us. We're to forgive others because God has forgiven us. Um, we, we demonstrate to others that which we have received from the Lord. In other words, at, at the end of, or excuse me, in James 2, verses 12 and 13, he says, um, so speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So if you have to err on one side or the other, err on the side of mercy. And then impartial. The wisdom from above is impartial. And we, we learned about that in James 2, the very the first section, verses 1 through 13, how, brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. Don't have favoritism. Don't discriminate on the basis of the flesh. Don't hold, don't be partial. And then he says that the wisdom from above is without hypocrisy. Without hypocrisy. In other words, um, someone who claims to love and follow the Lord, who says that, but yet on the other hand, um, acts like a child of the devil the rest of the week. You know, you're somebody, I've, 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 I've heard a couple of sayings about this. A hypocrite is someone who is not himself on Sunday. Okay. Um, uh, a hypocrite is someone who calls God our father, but acts like an orphan the rest of the week. Right? I mean, that's kind of what it, what it's about. But, but the wisdom, the person who, who, who has God's wisdom and understanding from above will not be a hypocrite. I'm not saying you're going to be perfect. I mean, we all stumble in many ways. We already saw that from James. But the trend, the overall trend of our life is toward a consistent Christian witness. And then he says in verse 18, Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace, by those who make peace. The fruitfulness of a life of wisdom. He talks about that in verse, um, the previous verse, he talks about full of mercy and good fruits. If you sow peaceable deeds, they will produce a harvest of righteousness within the church. Um, if, you, if, you, if you give off good fruit, if you're rich in reconciling activities and not in the things that cause dissension and division within the church, 
then you're gonna uh, you're going to have the fruit of righteousness, which is sown in peace by those who make peace. You know, there's some things that we need to be doing as Christians, like evangelizing, telling others about Jesus and the gospel. But some other reconciling activities that we should do as a church is, is yes, we should be about justice for the poor and the weak. We should be about that. Counseling for trouble, people, providing hospitality, shelter, food, and sending missionaries. That's all important stuff. Um, those are a part of what should characterize God's people. But then we come to chapter 4, and it's related because he talks about wars and fights. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? So this war, this war and this fighting that James talks about here in chapter 4 is coming from that hellish wisdom, that wisdom from which is beneath that we just talked about in chapter 3, which is really not wisdom at all. It's, it's ignorance that brings destruction. It's envy and selfish ambition. Those are the things that, that cause people to war and fight among each other. Um, envy and selfish ambition is about making a name for yourself making yourself look good in front of other people. Uh, uh, today, it's, it's a popular thing, if you're on the internet, to be a, 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 a social influencer. Someone whose people look to, to, to tell them what a, a certain, which products are good or which causes you should get behind and all of that stuff. But most of these influences are in it for themselves. They're not, they don't really care. It's all about them and their likes and how popular they are, and it's selfish ambition. Why do you think YouTube is called YouTube? <laughs> it's about you, pretty much. Um, you know, I put the sermons I preach on YouTube, but it, it's really not about me. I don't want it to be about me. It's about the Word. It's about the Gospel, and if Someone happens along and clicks on it and hears it, amen. But I'm not here to make a name for myself. I don't have a website with my name on it. It's the church. Um, and then Facebook. You know, Facebook can be used well, but a lot of times people get on there and boast and gloat and they talk about how wonderful everything is in their life and they're probably lying their head off. Right? It's almost like it, everything's a contest to, to who has the best life. Everything, a competition. Who can have the most stuff? Who can be the happiest? But in most cases, it's lives that people are twisting reality to make themselves look good. And it ultimately becomes about them. And there's a place for you to talk about yourself, but it's, it's the motive behind it, I guess, that kind of affects that. So where do the wars and fights come from? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and do not have. You murder. Can you believe that? People in the church thought it was okay to kill people and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. Now, I realize there's some people who might think, well, these can't be Christians because they certainly wouldn't think that way, but I still think these are very young, very immature believers who need a lot of guidance from James to say that, you know, that is not right. It's wrong to think and do these things and live that way. So, um, so he's talking about people who want things that they don't have and they see someone else with it and they want to get it from that person. In fact, um, it, it goes so far that they would be willing to kill to get it. They could kill a person physically, we know that. That's 
what we usually think of when we think of murder, but they could kill a person economically. They could rip them off and ruin the rest of their life. There's scams today out there that are crazy. People are getting duped and losing their retirement and all sorts of stuff. You can be killed reputationally. People can claim things about you that aren't true um, and ruin your life. You can get canceled, you know, just because maybe you stand up for what's right and true and they don't like it and they disagree with it and so they feel like they should do everything they can to basically erase your life as much as they can without physically killing you. People will lie to destroy other people and hurt them in a way that puts them above that person. I'm jealous of this person because they're getting attention or they have stuff or they do things that I wish I had. So I'm going to do something to hurt that person so I can get ahead of them. That's wrong. That's out of the pit of hell. He says, you fight and you war. That seems just like the wisdom from below that we just learned about that's earthly and sensual and demonic. But then he says, you do not have because you do not ask. We're supposed to ask the Lord and pray to the Lord. Don't, don't just turn to the, what you think in your flesh is the best thing to do. Turn to the Lord and do what he says. In other words, and uh, he, the wisdom from above is, a, just read that. To, to ask God for the wisdom. If you, if you lack it, just ask him. God wants to give you what you need, but you have to ask him and trust him for it. Look at verse three, verse, chapter four, verse three. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. If you ask God for things that have their source in evil desire, God's not going to bless that. If it's not for his glory and your good, he's not going to grant that request. So God saying no to you is a good thing. And when you have godly wisdom and you ask him properly, for the proper things, he's going to answer that. And then he, he says in verse four, look at these words, adulterers and adulteresses. Whoa, that's heavy right there. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Wow. Wow. If you want to be worldly and receive the applause and the praise and approval of men, you know what? That puts you at odds with God because you're living for that. That's your idol. That's your God. That's what you're living for instead of the God of the Bible. You will find yourself opposed by God because if we sneak down and look at verse 6, verse 6 tells us God resists the proud but he gives grace to the home. So it, it, you will be opposed by God. God does not and will not look the other way. God has not and never will change. Truth and righteousness and morality and good do not change because God does not change. And he defines what those are. But then he says that, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. What does it mean to be a friend of the world? It means to be, it doesn't mean to not love your neighbor, to, to, to love your neighbor. We're supposed to do that. What it means is to love the world's system, the world's ways the world's values, the philosophies of its world, the lies that the world believes. If you love that and adopt that and live like that and, and desire that, then that's what it means to be a friend of the world. Now, y'all know that there are a lot of enemies of God in our country today and around the world. Um, 
and and it's sad to me that we have people actively opposing truth and reality and actually feeling like if I preach that you're a sinner and Jesus can save you, that somehow I hate you. That just doesn't add up. But to someone who has wisdom from below, that makes sense to them. But these people who are at this point friends of the world, who are enemies of God, they need to come to the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. They need to repent and be saved because I don't want them to go to hell. That's not, I don't want anyone to go. So I and we together need to show and tell them the truth and love, no matter what it might cost us as far as comfort and safety. And a lot of times we value comfort and safety as Christians more than we value obeying the Great Commission to make disciples. He didn't say, as you are comfortable and safe, then make disciples. He just says, go make disciples. In fact, if you read the next letter over in the Bible, 1 Peter, uh, we are going to suffer for doing good, the Bible says. Jesus did, was perfect, and he suffered. So how much more are we going to? So let us not be ashamed of the gospel or of our Lord. Let us believe and say as Paul did, for I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. And then two verses left here. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously? Now your version might say, say that. It might say something a little different. This is kind of a hard passage to interpret. But here's where I'm at with it. I think God's spirit within us desires for us to live a godly life. And when we don't, we grieve the spirit. We quench the spirit. Um, the Spirit will lead us to live a holy life. After all, it is the Holy Spirit, right? It's not just the ordinary Spirit. <laughs> He's the Holy Spirit. He's the Spirit of God. And so we would live a life that is characterized by godliness, not by the world, the flesh, and the devil. So when we sin and go our way instead of God's way, as Christians, we grieve the Holy Spirit and quench the Holy Spirit to the degree that we become useless for God and the kingdom unless we confess and repent of our sins and turn back to the Lord. And then finally, verse six, and I love this one right here, but he gives more grace. Amen. Amen. He gives more grace. I love that. The antidote to spiritual adultery, which is what we were just reading about being friends of the world and uh, unfaithful to the Lord. The antidote to spiritual adultery is the grace of God. It is the grace of God. Uh, we didn't get to it today, but verse 10 tells us, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. If you continue to harden your heart and you're envious, if you have selfish ambition and you desire the approval and the accolades of the world, the Bible says that you make yourself an enemy of God and God will constantly resist you. He will resist the proud. That's what it says here in verse six. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. If you're too proud to humble yourself and admit you're wrong, that you're a sinner, and that God is holy and right and true, if you continue in that, you won't be saved. Now, I know he's talking to believers, and they need to repent, but it's true for everyone in general that doesn't know the Lord. If you continue in that, you won't be saved. But God gives more grace. And so there's no reason why someone today cannot be saved if they would just come to Christ and believe. 
So, um, so the Bible reminds us in Hebrews that while it is still called today, do not harden your hearts. Repent of your sin and turn to Christ in faith. He's the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to heaven without trusting in Jesus as their Lord and Savior. The Bible we just read, he gives more grace. And that's why right now today, as you hear this message, I believe God is using this to call you to himself. Whether you're sitting here live in person right now, or whether maybe somebody out in internet land watches later on YouTube. Who knows how God might use this? He gives more grace. Don't put him off. Because I've found it to be true in many people that if you say no to the Lord today, it gets easier to continue to keep on saying no to God. And when you say no to the God who has commanded all men everywhere to repent, because he's fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness, when you tell the only true God no, you just compound your sin and you go deeper into it. You dig yourself a deeper hole. And in just a minute, we're going to sing a hymn. And when we do, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you some options to consider as we sing this hymn. Um, I'd like you, if the Lord leads you to do this while we sing this hymn, maybe you're, today you realize you need to be saved, that you want to trust in Christ as your Lord and Savior. You, you believe he died for you and rose again so that you might receive the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of eternal life. Maybe that's the decision that you want to share with me today. Number two, maybe you've already been saved, but you've not been walking with the Lord. Maybe you've been allured by the world some, to some degree, like the people we were reading about here in James. And you, would, you want someone to admit that you've been far from God and you're coming back today. You're repenting and you're committing to follow Christ as his disciple. Or number three, you've been saved, but maybe you've just never been baptized. For whatever reason, you've just put it off. You've never followed through. And you need to fully obey the command of our Lord in that because partial obedience is really disobedience. And then number four, perhaps there's someone here today who's saved, you've been baptized, you've been walking in with the Lord, but yet you sense that maybe the Lord wants you to join this church and work with God's people here in our efforts to share the gospel. Um, whatever it is you come, we're going to sing, let me pray. Father God, we just pray right now that you would have your will and your way among us and do what you need to do. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Ms. Joan, come and leave us. <laughs>